This week on Christian World News, Nigeria on the brink as radical Muslims attack Christians in the north. Some fear a civil war is in the making. Plus, they're calling it a house of horrors. What happened at this Pennsylvania abortion clinic is so awful that the doctor is charged with four counts of murder. Yet, most of the American media are ignoring the story. And from the trash pile to the courts of the king, this woman made her living digging for junk until she found a Christian ministry willing to help her climb out. In a nation divided by religion, Muslim extremists could force a civil war. Hello everyone, I'm George Thomas. And I'm Wendy Griffith. Last year, more Christians were killed in Nigeria than in any other country. Senior international correspondent Gary Lane tells us why Nigerian believers are targeted and what can be done to help them. Bombings like this one gave Nigeria the sad distinction of the nation with the highest Christian death toll. More than 900 Christians reportedly were killed in Nigeria last year, victims of the Boko Haram terrorist group and other Islamic militants. They are so radical that they do not even spare Muslims. If Muslims are sympathetic to any cause at all, if they are sympathetic to, 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 to the Christians' cause or the minorities' cause, they are also termed as, you know, infidels. In 2013, radicals have killed more than 120 Nigerians, most of them Christians. Gregory Lahr is an international human rights attorney. It is happening now, not this time, because there appears to be a new resurgence, a new Islamic awareness on the need to further propagate their religion. Because of this wave of violence, various groups in southern Nigeria are taking up arms to protect the Christians. Attorney Emmanuel Ogebe warns the country may be on the brink of a broader conflict. Because of the massive Christian Muslim population in Nigeria, there's no country on earth that is as rich and ready for a religious war. Uh, all, the, all the elements, all the ingredients are there. Ogebe spoke at a recent conference sponsored by the Washington, D.C.-based Jubilee campaign. Some panelists criticized the U.S. State Department's reluctance to blame the violence in Nigeria on Islamic extremism. The route they are taking is dangerous, it's against American interest, and it's, it's not positive, it's not sensible. The ultimate aim of this is extremism. It's not just to wipe out Christians. It will hit back here ultimately. For years, Islamic militants limited their attacks on Christians to the 12 northern Nigerian states where Sharia law is in place. Now they're pressing into central and southern states where Christians are in the majority. World Magazine reporter Mindy Bell says the pattern is all too familiar. We've seen it happen in Sudan, we've seen it in Mali, we've seen it in parts of the Middle East and other parts of North Africa. When that happens, what is growing up in there are also the seeds of terrorism that is targeting the West. So what is the solution to stop the attacks against Christians and others? Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan has proposed a possible amnesty for Boko Haram terrorists. Stefanos Foundation founder Mark Lipto says amnesty would be a mistake. It goes to say that the government must have to uh, succumb to the pressure of terror. Uh, and then we see that it will go in to reward the perpetrator to continue to carry out his carnage. Uh, that is wrong. The problem has gone beyond Nigeria alone. Like it, it actually has its roots in Mali, in Libya. So even if the Nigerian situation is well contained and the borders are not secure, you have not solved the problem. Lipto suggests Christians united in prayer can make a difference. What we see is this unity that has taken on the church. And so the voiceless are not being represented. But if we look to the person Christ and avoid all these differences and come together, we will be able to give a voice to the voiceless, and that is what we're called to do. Gary Lane, CBN News. The rise of religious extremism is largely to blame for an increase in persecution of religious minorities around the world. That's the conclusion by the U.S. government panel. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, which advises the U.S. State Department, released its annual report this week. The report says extremists target religious minorities for violence, including physical assaults and even murder. 
Governments that fail to protect victims or even take part in persecution contribute to the problem, especially in countries where it is forbidden to change fates or there are laws against blasphemy. Joining us now is Knox Thames, uh, Director of Policy and Research at the U.S. CIRF. Knox, who are these religious extremists and, and who are their victims? Well, it's a trend that we've noticed spans the globe, uh, affecting countries as diverse as Nigeria and Burma, uh, Pakistan and uh, East Africa. Uh, these groups are often motivated by an extremist religious ideology that attack the religious other, um, either those within their own faith group who don't adhere to their extreme worldview or religious minorities who uh, are from a different faith community. And apparently this is especially happen happening in the so-called uh, Arab Spring countries like Egypt, Syria and Libya. What does the commission recommend the U.S. government do to protect religious minorities there? Well, I think this is one of the biggest challenges facing the United States in our diplomacy internationally. We've recommended that the United States designate 15 countries as the worst violators of religious freedom, uh, including Egypt. Uh, in the context of Egypt, it's because of government action and inaction, uh, government persecuting people for under blasphemy-like laws, but also allowing uh, street gangs to attack religious minorities like the Coptic Christian Church uh, with impunity. And it's time for uh, our government to, to let Cairo know that we want to see those violations end and uh, we should designate accordingly. Uh, and let's talk about, you mentioned blasphemy laws. Right now, uh, there's a Christian mother of three who's in jail in Pakistan convicted of blaspheming the Muslim prophet Muhammad. How, how common are these uh, cases around the world? Tragically, they're increasingly common. I think Pakistan is the worst situation for blasphemy laws. In our report, we identified 16 individuals in Pakistan who are on death row for allegedly blasphemous statements and another 20 individuals serving life sentences. And they're not all Christians, they're also Muslims. Um, but we've seen increasing cases in, in countries like Egypt. Uh, we've seen it in also other places like India and Greece. So it's a challenge to uh, freedom of thought, freedom of religion, uh, when you have governments deciding what is or isn't true, what is or isn't offensive. Mm. The report also mentions authoritarian governments oppressing minorities. Tell us about some of the worst nations. Well, China would be one for sure. Uh, its treatment of a range of religious groups, including Uyghur Muslims, Tibetan Buddhists, also the underground house church movements, the Catholic Church, uh, if you're not willing to play by the Chinese government rules, then you're going to be in for a world of hurt. Uh, other countries like Saudi Arabia, um, where the policy is for only one form of Islam and all others uh, face government repression and must practice their faith underground. Okay. Uh, and then also in Russia, we've seen increasing totalitarianism there that affects religious communities' ability to practice their faith freely. Uh, real quickly, last few seconds, have you seen any improvements in any countries when it comes to religious freedom issues? You know, there are uh, bright spots here and there around the world, um, but sadly, the overall trajectory, I think, is a downward one. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a role that our government can play to help uh, advocate for this fundamental human right. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much for your insights. Thanks for coming on the broadcast this week. Thank you. A Korean American has been sentenced to 15 years hard labor in a North Korea prison. Kenneth Bay of Washington State was arrested in November near the border of China and Russia. He's accused of committing hostile acts against the state. Friends and colleagues say Bay is a devout Christian. He frequently traveled to North Korea to feed orphans. He is the sixth American detained since 2009. Up next in America, an abortionist on trial for murder. See why prosecutors called his clinic a house of horrors. From CBN. Broken eardrum is playing at the Civic tonight. And you'll just have to miss it. This is so incredibly unfair. A special story of love and sacrifice. Oh, joy. Mom comes up with something. Christopher Quantum, you and I are going to discuss your attitude right this minute. Superbook. No. Join the Superbook DVD Club and get Superbook's newest episode, He is Risen. Plus, two copies to share with others, all for your gift of $25. They have arrested Jesus, the Messiah. Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you? No, please! You can't! They've taken him to Golgotha. 
We must hurry. Mary is about to lose her son. The worst thing any mother could face. I am not leaving her. Superbook. It's an amazing way to build a strong spiritual foundation in the children you love. Mary, who are you looking for? I've seen him. He is alive. Superbook. He is risen. Available now. It's a question each one of us must face. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. Where will you spend eternity? In Gordon Robertson's newest DVD, Life Beyond the Grave, Part 2, you'll meet real people who have died and experienced heaven or hell. See their personal eyewitness accounts of what happens when we die. There's more love than you can imagine. I was comforted. I had a peace and joy I've never had. In Life Beyond the Grave, Part 2, you'll discover a powerful tool to share the gospel with those you love, what the Bible says about eternal life, and how you can know for certain that heaven is your destiny. I was absolutely overwhelmed by this sensation of being home. You can have the assurance that when you die and are absent from your body, you'll be present with Jesus for all eternity. Welcome back to the show. Here in America, witnesses in a shocking trial testified to gruesome practices at a Pennsylvania abortion clinic. Former clinic workers told the court that Dr. Kermit Gosnell and his staff killed babies that had been born alive. Mm. Despite the horrific nature of the trial, it didn't get much coverage from the major media. John Jessup has the story from Philadelphia. It may be all smiles for these teens dancing in downtown Philadelphia, but just steps away in this courthouse, the trial of 72-year-old late-term abortion doctor Kermit Gosnell has driven many to anger and tears. It's really the first time that an African-American abortionist in an African-American neighborhood was preying on his own people for profit. Gosnell faces the death penalty, one in the death of a 41-year-old woman who overdosed while in his care, the others for killing babies by cutting their spines with scissors after they reportedly had been born alive. Past patients describe his now shuttered abortion clinic as a house of horrors. And I remember just walking through and looking and I seen some women that looked half dead. In reviewing the case, grand jury members said it was a failure to report and enforce broken violations that led to the clinic's deplorable conditions, including blood-stained furniture and walls, unsterilized medical equipment that spread venereal diseases, and fetal remains stored in paper bags and plastic jugs. We are looking at, at a, uh, a killing field of human beings because one person and a lot of people didn't have courage to go ahead and follow up and make sure that there were safe conditions in that abortion clinic. Dan and Felzer and others blame former Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge, a pro-choice Republican, for ending clinic inspections in the 90s. Unless you are a pro-life governor, you're probably not gonna have the backbone and the courage to go ahead and enforce the regulations as they're put on the books. She and others don't limit the blame to state and city authorities. Critics point out the media have dropped the ball, too. I've been doing this for 25 years, and uh, I, I, don't, I don't recall any big league media, mainstream media, uh, ever being shamed into doing a story. Hardly any major news outlets covered the case. But then a liberal commentator railed against reporters in this USA Today column for originally failing to cover Gosnell's trial. J.D. Mullane writes for the Bucks County Courier Times and has been described as the lone reporter at the trial from the beginning. He believes the case and the grand jury's report has the potential to reshape the national debate over abortion. CBN News first reported on the grand jury's findings back in February 2011. I am convinced that if only half of what is in that report were known to the American public, uh, given coverage by you know, uh, the mainstream media, especially the, the TV networks. Roe versus Wade and the unfettered right to an abortion uh, would be as vigorously debated in America as the Second Amendment is after the Sandy Hook Elementary School massacre. I'm convinced of it. It is that bad. But not bad enough for the White House to weigh in. 
When asked about President Obama's opinion earlier this week, Press Secretary Jay Carney said the president was aware of the case and does not and cannot take a position on an ongoing trial. John Jessup, CBN News, Philadelphia. And coming up, millions of Indians live a lifetime in poverty. You'll meet one woman who rose from the trash heap and the Christian ministry that helped her. CBNnews.com. News you want, when you want, 24-7. Stay current with up-to-the-minute stories. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, New York. I don't have to wait for my news anymore. CBNnews.com at your fingertips all day long. I only watch the stories I want to see. I find the story, I click on it, and boom, I'm there. Embassy in Washington, Eric Stackelbeck, CBN News. The source for your news, CBNnews.com. Hi, this is Pat Robertson. This is an important time in the history of America. It's an important time in the history of CBN. And what you do is so very important now. But we've got to get the gospel out here in America. We've got to help the poor and the needy, feed those who are hungry, clothe those who are naked, bring medical attention to those who are suffering, and more than anything, bring hope to those who are without hope throughout the world. So your 700 Club membership makes a huge difference. And I ask you to go to your phone and call. If you haven't already called in, we appreciate what you've done so much. So don't slack. We don't want our hands to be empty. We want to say, Lord, here are those who have come to you because of my labors. Telephones are available, toll-free line, and we just thank God for each one of you. So don't hesitate to call and do it now. It was the most angelic, the most peaceful, safe, loving place. I wasn't afraid. There was not a feeling of time. I was comforted. I had a peace and joy I've never had. I was absolutely overwhelmed by this sensation of being home. You just can't even imagine. In recent months, India's women have been rising up to protest sexual violence and degradation they face on a daily basis. They want tougher laws and say Indian society needs to cultivate a new attitude of respect towards women. Yeah, big problem in that country. You know, for years, Christian ministries have been working to help Indian women overcome the odds. Well, not too long ago, I met a woman who not only overcame terrible poverty and abuse, but forgave those who put her in harm's way. It's been said the most beautiful people are those who've known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, and have found their way out of the depths. Rupa Raju is one of them. I've had a difficult life since my childhood and experienced more horrible things than most people my age. You see, at a young age, Rupa was forced by her parents to join the ranks of India's so-called rag pickers. These are men, women, and young children who rummage through filthy garbage heaps in the cities of India, looking for anything that can be recycled and sold. Plastic, bottles, metal parts, pieces of glass, rotting discarded food. My day started at 4 or 5 in the morning, and I picked trash for 10 to 12 hours. On a good day, she'd earn about $2, and that was a good day. Here on the streets, where dogs were her only companion, and millions of squirming maggots, flies, rats, and crows, a constant distraction, she'd compete with other rat pickers for a few scraps. When I got older, my mother told me I wasn't bringing in enough money picking trash, so I was forced to sleep with men to bring more money. I became a prostitute. With tears welling up in her eyes, she describes the rage she felt toward her parents. I thought of running away. I didn't trust my parents. How could they do such a thing to me? I was angry. I wanted to kill them. I wanted something terrible to happen to them. Rupa is a Dalit, a so-called untouchable. Indian society labels Dalits lowest of the law, impure, less than human. Almost all rag pickers are Dalits. And like her, many young girls end up as prostitutes or get caught in a web of human trafficking. When I think about it, I begin to cry. 
But that's the past. Tonight's graduation night and Rupa is all smiles. The Rupa of old is not the Rupa you see today. I cannot begin to explain to you what God has done in my life. She has God and Jeevaleen Kumar to thank for her transformation and this momentous evening. We really look forward to this night because uh, we see our women being liberated, being emancipated. Jivalin Kumar runs Tarika Women's Center, a Christian ministry that takes in, rehabilitates, and empowers scores of young women at risk. Almost two years ago, Rupa came to the center looking for help. Here, she got counseling, learned how to speak English, took sewing and computer classes, and eventually had her dignity restored. She also met dozens of other young women like herself who had similar life experiences. What I like to personally communicate to them is that I would never ever give up on any one of those women, no matter how many times they fall, because I know it is a struggle for them. Today, the Tarika Center is just one of a handful of Christian ministries operating here in India, trying desperately to rescue thousands of Dalit women from human trafficking and sexual bondage. For many of these victims, such ministries are a lifeline to a better future. Rupa says it was at the center she discovered with great delight her worth in God's eyes. I come from a Hindu background. I knew very little about Jesus Christ. When I came to Tarika, I started reading the Bible and then understood what freedom really means and how much I mean to God. Ultimately, it's the Bible's view of them that Kumar says brings lasting transformation. They can't believe it because all these years they've been told that they are lower than animals. And here we are telling them that they are created in the image of God. And that just hits them, that just blows them away. On a recent Friday evening, Rupa joined 105 women on stage for a graduation ceremony honoring their completion of an 18-month course at Tarika. And sitting in the audience that night were Rupa's mother and father. They told CBN News this was the proudest moment of their lives. The Tarika Center has done a great job. My daughter is a different person. I feel bad for the things we did to her, but now I want her to study well and have a good future. And perhaps it's this image of Rupa holding her father's hand that speaks volumes of one life transformed by the power of the gospel. She told CBN News later she's forgiven her parents for forcing her into prostitution. Every night before I go to bed, I thank God for Tarika Center. I thank God for rescuing me from my past. These days, she works as a confident sales assistant in a large department store located on the most famous shopping street in the city. Same street, by the way, where she once picked trash. Her real desire, though, is to minister to broken and abused young women. There are many people who took care of me and showed love to me. I want to do the same for others. That will make me happy. Oh my goodness, wow. And to imagine, you know, these are people called the, the untouchables. The untouchables. They're the lowest of the lowest. And when the gospel of Jesus Christ comes and touches them, yeah. the empowerment, the worth that they receive by believing that there yes. is this man, this God that loves me mm. beyond anything else. Yeah. And I'm no longer a, uh, an animal, but I'm something worth in the eyes of God. Powerful story. Yeah, praise God. Thanks, George. We'll be right back. Come on, Give me go. that. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Ah, sure, life is busy, but I found a way to make a huge difference in people's lives. I guess you could say I'm changing the world right here from home. I bring medical supplies and doctors to people in need and dig wells so that villagers can have clean and safe water to drink. I make it possible to preach the gospel in over a hundred countries, including right here in America. And when disaster strikes, I'm there, providing food thank you, and emergency supplies to give people hope again. Every day, CBN and I are making the world a better place. Here you go. My life is hectic, so I joined CBN through Pledge Express. My bank does all the work, and I know that my gift is being used where it's needed most. So become a CBN partner and join Pledge Express because you can do a world of good right from where you are. Hi, good morning. Are you ready to get started? What if you knew heaven is real because you'd seen it? 
everything's alive. Nothing's dead. Because you'd been there. There's more love than you can imagine. How would it change the way you live your life? He was so eager. We got to get people saved. We got to let people know about Jesus. Get the real story from people who've experienced life beyond the grave. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Your giving makes it all possible. Call and join the 700 Club today. Well, this week marked the 62nd annual National Day of Prayer here in America. That's right. Millions of Americans from coast to coast participated. But the main event took place in the halls of the United States Capitol. Take a look. And forgive us, mighty God. From near and far. We flew in from LAX Airport in Los Angeles. I'm from uh, Calvary Christian School, which is a small private school in Old Bridge, New Jersey. People packed into the U.S. Capitol in Washington to pray for America, the motto for this year's annual observance. It started 62 years ago here in the States, and organizers say it's now grown to include more than 42,000 prayer gatherings across the country. In this crowd, some familiar faces like Vonette Bright, James and Shirley Dobson, and the legendary Pat Boone. God, we cry out to you. Together, they prayed for repentance, for blessing, and for our leaders in the military and the judicial, legislative, and executive branches of government, all of which were represented. Barry Black, chaplain of the Senate, urged people to stop praying for just themselves and to start praying for their leaders, even if they disagree with their politics. Pray for all people because our blessed Lord desires all men and women to be saved. Many voiced concerns about a culture slipping further away from its Christian roots, a topic addressed by keynote speaker Greg Laurie, pastor of Harvest Christian Fellowship. Revive your work as you did in days gone by. Show us your power to save us. And that's what we need to pray, Lord. Do it again. But gay rights activists denounced Laurie's participation, citing his, quote, blatantly anti-LGBT message and calling it, quote, out of step with what the majority of people of faith across the country believe. But supporters say Lori's only guilty of preaching the Bible. In spite of what they see, people here say they have hope because of prayer and they look forward to the future and coming back together to pray again this time next year. John Jessup, CBN News, Capitol Hill. A wave of prayer going around the world. Great way That's to end awesome. the show. Sure is. Yeah, Folks, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us this week. That's right. Until next week, from all of us here at Christian World News, God bless you, and we'll see you next time.